Chapter 11, The Unglamorous Grind. Every situation, opportunity, or decision I've ever made has led up to me writing this book, which on the surface is a pretty incredible feat. However, if you go a few layers down to who I am at the core, this book is pretty ridiculous and really silly. This book is really just a glorified diary. I wanted to give you a glimpse of my upbringings, my failures, my successes. I also wanted to open up, be vulnerable, and share my stories because I feel like they're relatable. Articulating my thoughts and feelings and situations that I've described has taken more mental energy and memory more than I can imagine. I decided to write this book because of significant changes in my life. And this stemmed from my breakup with my girlfriend earlier this year. That event sucked a lot. Now, what has happened since though is what this chapter is all about. It's the process of going from a heartbreak to a breakout. One of the reasons why I believe I came out of my situation stronger than ever is because I read many personal development books. Name any renowned self-help books and I probably read it. The Five Love Languages, How to Win Friends and Influence People, The Compound Effect, and The Dream Manager. And those are on the list with many more. I believe that reading these books saved me from spiraling downwards into darkness. So how did it save me? Through my experience in sales over the last decade, I've been brainwashed into thinking positively and holding myself accountable. My mantra is that you have complete control over whether your actions work or not. Like, you can't blame the customer for not buying. You need to look within yourself and see that you didn't have the skills to win the customer over. By practicing these principles, I've learned that if anything bad happens to me, my reaction is always within my control. When my relationship ended, I went through the stages of grief. I spent two weeks in absolute solitude. I didn't tell anyone and I moved back home. My mom would ask me why I was home all the time and I never really answered her. I just shrugged it off and said, ah, don't worry about it. That experience taught me that you should never do that. It's fucking awful. If you're sad, tell someone. Vent. Let it out. Keeping myself to myself for those two weeks negatively impacted my emotional physical state. My sadness ate me up from the inside out. Motivation and drive were completely sucked out of me and I cried a lot. Ten years with someone's a long time. Through sales, I've been blessed to have access to business coaches and mentors who taught us strategies for selling and maintaining mental health. One of the best things I learned from working in sales and reading self-help books was journaling. For a long time, I never really saw the point of it. And At one of the conferences I went to, a speaker gave us an exercise which we had to jot down one or more sentences uh, three times a day. Every day for two weeks uh, about how we were feeling. And that meant writing something in the morning, the afternoon, and evening. I was in awe of how much of an impact that speaker had. His presentation was funny, genuine, and it just made sense. It taught me something that is prevalent in my speech and that I'm using in this book. Use humor with purpose. I'm no comedian, but I find everything that happened in my life to be comical. Being able to go backstage and meet San Holo, getting catfished and then making out with a hot blonde, being homeless and sleeping in a playground while selling like mad, having an adult hissy fit and fighting a paper towel dispenser. To me, that kind of shit's really funny. But being able to share these stories is the best part. Every one of life's challenges that I've overcome has made me stronger than I was before. My job in life has been more of a grind than glamour and that's still happening now that I'm writing this book. I live in a constant struggle for continued growth and I feel pretty good at my sales job but I constantly feel like I'm not capable. Though whenever I doubt myself, it's because I'm comparing myself to 30 year veterans in the business. There's no way I can compete financially with or have the skills of someone that's been in the business since before I was even born. Now, sooner or later, playing the comparison game can only get you down. So here's a classic example. Imagine you just graduated university and you got a job in your respective field. Congratulations, that's awesome. However, you see your friends who don't even have a degree buy nice things because they had a knack for business or, hey, mom and dad gave them the golden ticket, allowing them to enjoy immediate success. This could upset you. So you make up a story that because you went to school, you should be more successful than those who didn't. You measure success in terms of how much someone travels, what their house is like, what kind of car they have, and what other toys they own. You start telling yourself, well, I want that too. I need more money. You then dig yourself a hole financially, mentally, and maybe physically. You start tracking your finances, you give in to peer pressure, and then you start feeling the fear of missing out. 
You also start racking up your credit cards so you can go traveling with money you don't even have. You're feeling stressed if you wear the same dress or shirt to a party that you wore before because you're working more to make more. You start eating out and you stop working out and you get fat. <laughs> When you play a comparison game like this, you live fast, but it's not sustainable. About 0.01% of the population is born into riches or excels in just about everything they do. Most of us will never be like them. If money, status, material possessions are driving you to make decisions that will make you be like someone you think is more successful, you're going to have to reevaluate. The bottom line is don't compare yourself to others. Of course, this is easier said than done. When you compare yourself to your friends and your family and your coworkers or anyone else, you fall into the trap of trying to play catch up. You can't live your best life if you're trying so hard to live somebody else's life. Real happiness through abundance and success will only come when you start comparing yourself to another person. It took me a long time to figure this out, but when I stopped giving a fuck about what other people thought about me, it just relieved a lot of pressure. I didn't have to try to impress others, I just had to focus on myself. If you're living in your parents' basement, don't feel bad because you think your friends have left home like grown-ups. Be happy that you could save thousands of dollars in rent while you work, and then you get that opportunity to build a relationship with your parents. There's no need to feel ashamed. Personally, I have a wonderful relationship with my mom and dad because I stayed at home. When a lot of people my age start to leave to get their own place. Plus, I use all that money I save to invest in myself. Now, how stressful does it sound to run somebody else's race? Stop judging yourself and start creating your own life. Have you read up to this point? You've seen that my life was created by eating a ton of shit and grinding through the unglamorous. I like to talk about a friend of mine who's struggling with this concept of the unglamorous grind. He's been working at the front desk at a gym for almost a year and initially it was an amazing job. He got a free membership and most of his friends exercised at the facility. So he got really fit too. His passions are lifting and videography, so he used the money that he saved on the membership fees to buy the nicest camera and equipment. That gave him an idea for his first side hustle. When he originally told me the idea of making highlight videos for competitive lifters and selling them a videography package for their social media, I was so proud of him. He found a great way to mix his passion at such a young age of 22. As the months gone by though, his love for his job started to wane. When you work at the gym, most of the time you're cleaning after other members. The chalk, the wipes, the liquid, the dust, the dirt. You have to clean it all up. It's not glamorous at all. When my friend's side hustle started to grow, his ego began to take over. It started telling him that he shouldn't be cleaning as much as he was, or he could make more from filming and editing videos. He began to believe other staff were not doing as much as he was. I understand that a bit of success can inflate and boost the ego, but in my friend's case, it's not a signal to start regarding his day job. If he wants his side hustle to grow and become his main hustle, he needs to continue eating shit, or in this case, cleaning it. It doesn't make sense for him to quit or complain about the job that is giving him free access to the people that will use his services. For him to grow his business, he needs access to people. Because you need more than a friend or two to use your services to, well, make it a viable business. Getting a business off the ground takes a lot of effort though. Entrepreneurship is not easy or glamorous. My friend is the front end and back end step of his empire. He's the salesperson, the bookkeeper, the web designer, the video editor, the marketing team, and he's on the front lines taking videos and photos. He cleans up after people all day, then has to work late into the night doing stuff that he isn't getting paid to do. But he can leverage his day job to make all that extra stuff worthwhile. Right now, he needs to use his time at the gym as an income generating networking opportunity. Every gym member that walks in is a potential client. By communicating with members while working, he can develop relationships inside and outside the gym, which can make him top of mind as the fitness photographer and videographer. It doesn't matter how many other photographers or videographers are out there in the city. What matters is whether he is in front of potential clients and maximizing every moment with them. Finding abundance is about searching for opportunities and exploring the options presented to you. Just because you clean toilets doesn't mean you're in a dead-end job. If you're not having fun, you need to take a step back and have empathy with and sympathy for yourself. 
Why aren't you having fun? What can you do to make it fun? What can you do to make it a learning experience? Being aware of what you want and who you are is the first step towards figuring out how to make money while having fun. I want to expose you to this because once you know that your mindset and everything you do is in your control, you will have given yourself the best chance to take the bad with the good. After the split with my girlfriend, I felt alone for the first time in 10 years. It took a while, but eventually I came to the realization that we're not getting back together and I just couldn't drown in sorrow. I was still struggling emotionally as my birthday approached, so I called up a friend who's like a sister to me and I just told her I needed someone to hang out with. We talked a bit on the phone and had one of those conversations when you really feel sad and you just talk out of your ass. Ah, fuck sis, I'm so sad, I want to jump out of a plane. Haha, you're so funny Wilson, she said. And told me that she's only a couple minutes away. Right then and there, I had a aha moment. I knew I'd been talking a ton of shit and didn't really want to jump out of a plane and die. It was just a silly phrase I spat out. But it dawned on me that people literally do it for a living. And then it hit me. Why didn't I just do it for real? But without dying. After I hung up, I instantly went to a computer and googled skydiving near me. I didn't care how much it cost. I was determined to keep my word. I clicked the first link that popped up and searched the company's upcoming jumps. Since my birthday was coming up, I wanted to jump for joy on that day. Unfortunately, they didn't have anything for that day, so I just booked a jump for the day before. I paid right away and made sure I kept my word. When my sister arrived, I jumped in the passenger seat of her car just laughing. What's so funny? Remember when I said I was sad and I wanted to jump out of a plane? Well, I'm doing it. I just booked a skydive for Monday. What the fuck? I was just on the phone with you like two minutes ago. Yeah, after you hung up, I booked my jump. You're fucking crazy, she said laughing. With that act, I was starting to take back control over how I felt emotionally. It was tough letting go of the angst and the what ifs and the what could I have done to salvage the relationship types of questions. I came to the realization about the relationship that pushed me to strive for more. Sometimes you just need to flip from one emotional extreme to the other in an instant. Going skydiving was like living those two emotional experiences at the same time. Even though I was sad, I was exhilarated too. I found out that I'd be jumping with a Canadian veteran who's been jumping out of planes for the last 30 years. It was to be a tandem jump, so I knew that if I was going to die, he would die too, as the worst case scenario. Reminding myself of this was my way of curbing my fear because I figured that with his experience, the odds of anything bad happening were slim. On the day of the jump, I woke up early, drove to the site, and did my orientation. I then put on my jumpsuit. I waited around a while since there was a lot of people ahead of me. In the weeks before, there had been a lot of forest fires in California, and the smokes kept blowing north into Canada, and that caused many jumps to be postponed until the day I was jumping. When my turn came, I was calm, but energized. I felt a mixture of sadness and elation at the realization that I was about to jump out of a plane. I also knew that I needed to go back to work in that afternoon. The plane was a tiny 1969 Cessna that only took five people. The interior was ripped out for maximum space, but it was still very intimate. It took about 20 minutes to get to the jumping altitude of 10,000 feet, And during our ascent, I was gifted with some spectacular views. And again, there's no turning back. I was jumping out of this plane one way or another. When you're high enough that houses look like ants and the subdivided land looks like a patchwork quilt, a lot goes through your mind. I thought about work I needed to do after the jump. I thought about how loud the engine was or how rickety the door of the plane was. I thought about the past weekend and what I wanted to eat later. I just thought about everything. I had butterflies in my stomach, but I was still very calm and had a bit of bravado left in my system. Though, when they finally opened the door and all I can hear was the (laughs) of the propeller, I had an oh shit moment. I was in a tiny ass plane with the doors open at 10,000 feet about to jump out. I tiptoed onto the metal footrest and then sat down on the edge of the door, ready to go. All right, let's do this, shouted my jumping partner over the noise. Hold on, in three, two. And then we jumped. The initial feeling of falling just lasted a few seconds. We did two front flips, and then it was gone. 
What followed was the coolest feeling in the world. It reminded me of riding a motorcycle. That extreme sensation in those moments made me forget about literally everything. It didn't matter what had happened in the past or what I needed to get done later that day. I felt present in the moment. This was real. Everything else was just a thought. It's easy to spend too much time in your head overthinking and overanalyzing, but when you're falling at 190 kilometers an hour, there's nothing going through your head. It's just a mix of fear, euphoria, and joy overwhelms everything else. It's exhilarating. Then the parachute opens. Words can't really describe what that feels like, but I'll try them. Although I was gliding through the air, it felt like everything was in slow motion. The air was crisp and clean, and I had free movements of my arm and legs. My ears were a bit cold from the altitude, but I had a 360 degree of viewing pleasure. There's no obstruction to my view of the clouds above or farms and homes in the distance below. It was the most rewarding and liberating experience. Gliding through the sky was so peaceful and quiet that I could feel and hear my heartbeat. As we approached the ground, any feeling of sadness or worries were wiped from my thoughts. I acknowledged that they were not gone forever, but they did not inhibit my ability to move forward with my day. I felt truly at peace with my situation and myself. Even now, it seems crazy that my commitment to something based off an impulsive sentence I said when I was feeling down would lead me to have such a life-changing moment. The only person who knew I was going skydiving that day was my sis. I didn't tell my mom or my dad because I knew what they would want to know first. How much would it cost? I told them after the fact and my mom's response was, What? $300 to jump out of a plane? Why didn't you just let your dad drive you down the highway with the windows rolled down and you could have just paid for the speeding ticket? Um, my dad just thought I was crazy. <laughs> Sometimes things don't turn out the way you think they're supposed to. That applies as much to work and business as it does to relationships. Having the mindset to come to terms with this is something we all need to constantly work on. Just because you have a photo with your significant other on Instagram doesn't actually mean you're in a happy relationship. Equally, you might think you have a successful business, but life can suddenly kick you in the throat and you'll need to deal with it. Sure, you could put on a brave face every day for the people around you because you're petrified of being judged, but when you get home, you'll find yourself asking, what the fuck am I doing? And you have to figure it out. Whatever extremes you go through, remember that your feelings are in your control. It's okay to be sad, but catch yourself when you're aware of how you feel so you don't dwell on it for too long. Snap out of it. What's the craziest thing you've always wanted to do? What's something that people never thought you could do? Do it. Change your direction. Make it your breaking point where you will change your way of thinking and act to make it better. When you do this, something happens to you. You forget about your woes and your problems because you focus on the task at hand. You shocked your system, forcing the change and breaking through the limiting mindset you had for yourself before. When hope starts fading, we feel weak and hate ourselves for living that way. So don't pretend it's going to be all right. When you accept who you are, you can move forward. It's not easy and it's not going to change overnight. It could take months, years, but it doesn't matter though. Once you make the change and commit to the unglamorous grind, everything you achieve will not only humble you, but make you proud of yourself. What you accomplish will let you realize that you're capable of being an incredible human being. Up to now in this book, I've been sharing with you my struggles for success. Being the son of a working class immigrant means that it was never going to be an easy journey. There are moments when I felt fear and uncertainty and doubt. Some challenges beat me down, but I always ended up facing them with a smile even when I didn't know what to expect. I was yearning for others to believe in me. I wanted to be the best, but I had to learn the best way to get the support I needed. The journey of entrepreneurship, like jumping out of a plane, was something I couldn't turn back from once I committed to it. Secure long-term abundance was what I was chasing. Call it the Canadian dream. I'm on a pilgrimage for my idea of success. The unglamorous grind is watching everyone pass you by while you move towards your goal. It's the ability to set those goals and have absolute conviction that hitting them is the only way. It's about being able to reflect on how ridiculous and hilarious the journey can be. 
It's about having mental fortitude to keep doing what you're doing even if there's no results for months, years, working tirelessly on skills that open doors of opportunity everywhere you go. It's holding yourself to the highest level of accountability and knowing that you, your word, is absolute and binding. It's the ability to sustain positive and enthusiasm even when you fail over and over again. The day that you decide to accept that the grind will be shitty is the day you will stop worrying about the opinions of others and rely on the ability to take action, develop skill, and find the abundance you've been craving. Chapter 11 Summaries If you say you're going to do it, you better do it. Breakups suck, but self-loathing is even worse. If you bitch and complain a lot, nobody will want to hang out with you. Go skydiving, it's good for your health. Keep eating shit if you want to succeed, just don't get used to the taste. Again, the grind isn't always glamorous, but you can be proud of yourself for the actions you've taken.